While at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens, we had an opportunity to tour the high elevation orchid house with botanist Becky Brinkman. ABG has one of the best collections of montane orchids in the country, and the curation and lushness of the conservatory was on full display when we were there. I'm Becky Brinkman. I'm the Fuqua Orchid Center manager. When you came through those doors over there, you mm -hmm. entered the Fuqua Orchid Center, which is a 16,000 square foot glass house that supports our orchid collection. And it consists of a seasonal display area, which we're standing in right now, a tropical high elevation house, the orchid display house, um, a microprop lab, um, and an orchid reference library, and a classroom. And so the tropical, or the alpine exhibit is where we're going to go now, right? That's where we're going to go now. Is this your favorite part of this section? Or? This is a super special part of the garden. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and you'll Not see why. Not playing favorites, okay. <laughs> This episode is brought to you by my new podcast, Bad Seeds. The phrase black market evokes sinister images. Stacks of AK-47s, crates of cocaine, but potted succulents on a windowsill? No one is calling Crime Stoppers for that. But maybe you should, because the biggest black market you've never heard of might be blooming right under your nose. This plant could sell for between ten dollars and $15,000 on the open market. And where there's big money, there are bigger risks. We were just tied up with what looked like garden string behind our backs, and these big M16 stuck to our heads. I'm Summer Rain Oaks. I'm a plant expert and author. On the Bad Seeds podcast, we plunge straight into the underworld of plant crime. From Mexican drug cartels to corrupt elected officials, we explore how the black market for plants has repercussions for you, me, and the fate of the planet. Listen to Bad Seeds on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. You do quite a job curating in here, huh? Yeah, this is a wonderful place. This is the tropical high elevation house. It's, lots of gardens have an, an alpine house. Yeah. But this is a little different. This is for plants from 6,000 feet and higher in the tropics. In the in tropics. Montane yeah, region. Alpine feels like it's like more, it's mountainous, but it's sparser in a way. Mm -hmm. You know, when I've gone to alpine houses, this is lush. Yeah. <laughs> for a couple of reasons. One is the diversity. There's probably more diversity per square foot in this greenhouse than anywhere else in the garden. Also, uh, the cooling system is super special in here. In order to keep uh, the conditions cool and moist, we don't use a conventional air conditioning system. We use what's called an air washer, which is a system that's used in the textile industry during the manufacture of textiles in order to uh, cool and humidify and keep static electricity down. So when how does it work? We got in touch with the people uh, in a textile factory not too far from here and asked yeah. them if they would custom build one uh, for our greenhouse. And so uh, the way it works is down below us in the basement mm -hmm. uh, is the equipment, right? It starts out uh, uh, with a chiller that pre-cools the water to 42 degrees. And then the water enters uh, what's called the rain chamber, which is, um, uh, has a wall with a grid of spray bars and nozzles. Um, and that 42 degree uh, water then uh, becomes like a fine mist 
Huh. Right. A wall of fine mist. Is it kind of similar to what they have in the greenhouses? Like in the back of the wall, they have the cooling wall, or is it is it dissimilar to it's that? It's kind of the same concept. Okay. Yeah. But the the water that flows through the system is much cooler. It's okay. Forty two degrees. Yeah. And so on the other side of the uh, the rain chamber is a very large fan, uh -huh. like fifteen by fifteen, that draws air through that that water wall. That chilly water wall, and then the air comes up here, yeah, it's forced up here, and it creates a wonderful, buoyant, cool, humid, misty environment that you wouldn't get with conventional air conditioning. How did you even like come upon a system like that trying to recreate like an outdoor system? I just can't even fathom. Yeah, it was just yeah. a stroke of genius on wow. the part of uh, the guy who built this place. Well, that is the first time that I've heard that. Well, why don't you take us through some of the amazing species that you have here? I mean, if you have sure. the most diversity packed in, I, I guess we don't even have to walk that far in order to be able to hit a lot of plants. <laughs> right, right. Well, uh, there are three different geographical regions represented here. Right now we're standing in the, among the flora of uh, the Andean tropics. Andes of South America. Mm -hmm. uh, all these plants around the, the waterfall and on the other side of the pathway mm -hmm. are the things that you would see if you were traveling through the mountains in Peru mm -hmm. and Ecuador and Colombia. Well, I'm not an orchid connoisseur, so you're going to have to take me through some of the species that we're seeing here sure. and any kind of natural history or personal stories that you might have with them. Well, what's really hot in here right now are the maxillarias. Uh, there's this wonderful maxillaria fletcheriana that's flowering here. It's um, robust. It's, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Big hefty thing. Maxillaria splendens, chilleriana, um, and then there are more, more very wonderful species in the back of the greenhouse. You tried to put some of the genera together? They were mounted onto this tree branch. We wanted to have like a little maxillaria display. Mm -hmm. you know, in the tropics, there would actually be a little more, a few other things mixed in with them. Now, do you find with like the, the orchids, like the, the maxillaria, they're obviously in the same, they obviously are in the same genus. They're in the same type of habitat. Do you find this genus to be across a range of habitats or is it one of those ones that kind of uh, are a conglomerate within this type of ecoregion? They're a little bit widespread. There are okay. some that occur in more exposed areas and some in more humid areas. Yeah. yeah. There are other things besides orchid here if you're into anthurium. Oh, the anthurium, that is a dark space right there. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Is that a cultivar or is that? No. That's a species. Yeah. What species is that? Cabarensi. Cabarensi. Yeah. Big heart-shaped leaves, but that, yeah, that is pretty cool. And behind it is probably the largest anthurium in here. Do you see that anthurium giganteum up on top of the waterfall with oh, the immense leaves? This up? one. It looks almost like a ginormous cabbage leaf. <laughs> it does. We actually had to lash it to the side of the building because we yeah. were afraid it was going to topple over <laughs> one day. There's a really cool one over here. Ovetifolium, Anthurium ovetifolium. Yeah. You can see it's uh, actually in fruit right now. Yep, with the big red fruits. The spadix um, is loaded with bright red fruits. And as you look around, you'll notice lots of little orchids in the trees. Mm -hmm. What do you do to affix them? Is it just fishing line or how do you? We use fishing line. Okay. Some of my colleagues swear by pantyhose. I know, I see I see a lot of pantyhose. <laughs> pantyhose. Yeah. But uh, I'm not in the pantyhose school, so um, <laughs> we use monofilament here. But notice how small most of the orchids are. These are all orchids growing in the trees here. Look at the tiny little. This is uh, what you'd find at high elevations in the tropics, miniature orchids. Yeah. Yeah, the energetic cost of producing a large plant body at high elevations where it's really cool is just, just cost prohibitive. So most of the orchids that you see at high elevations are teensy weensies. I mean, this is why you could boast the amount of diversity because you could fit all, like uh -huh. a dozen on one little branch. Yeah. There are some super special. Yeah, yep, there it is. Little, little tiny little lepanthes in full bloom. And then what is this like little purple thing in the back that doesn't? It doesn't look like an orchid to me. It is. It's Devalia, and there's one of my faves Ooh. right here. They look like green beans yes, hanging Don't off. they? If you touch that leaf, it's got a coarse texture to it. Oh yeah, Isn't that terrific plant. That's a Pleurothallis. Pleurothallis dilemma. Why do they call it dilemma? Just because. That's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a... It's a dilemma. Yeah. <laughs> and then how about this? That's a little Stellus. 
This kind of reminds me mm. a little bit of the one that I recently had picked up that they called it the, oh, see, I'm not good at orchids. They called it like red wheat. I don't know, the red wheat, they have, do you know what I'm talking about? That's what it looks like. But this one's kind of cool too, because it has the under, the underbelly of the uh, leaf surface to purple, which I know a lot of people kind it of is. enjoy that color. It is, and uh, yeah, that's one that actually uh, can grow at brighter light and brighter light conditions, mm -hmm. and those leaves will turn bright red. Hmm. See, that's kind of unusual, because a lot of those um, understory plants typically have that are, uh, used to growing in not so bright light, have that purple underbelly, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's fascinating that it could take some highlight too. If you look up, you'll see some of the Dracula orchids. This guy right here. Oh, wow, he's in bloom. Little Chestertonii. The lip of that Dracula orchid uh, is a fungus mimic. It's uh, trying to attract fungus gnats. <laughs> yeah, as a as pollinator. Right, as a pollinator. Yeah. And there's something, another one behind you. Look at this guy. He's kind of on his way out, it looks like. It reminds me a bit more of the coloration of like an Aristolochia flower. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And what about this guy right here? Oh, Probably has nice. Yeah. Some of these produce fragrances that are carrion like to attract and, flies. And it looks like a little yeah, like yeah. red meat. Yeah. That one, I think, in particular, can mm. smell kind of foul on some days. Well, I don't need to go to the spa today. <laughs> this, I just saw some of these plants it's an ericaceous type plant, right? It is. Have you ever tasted it? Um, they heard... do produce fruit. Yeah, yeah. these I are heard... some of the neotropical blueberries. Blueberries, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we'll see more of those up on the waterfall, okay. some of that with actual fruits. Do you know what species this is? That's a Maclenia. I think okay. it's Pentaptera. Okay. I saw them first with uh, Chad Husby at Fairchild Tropical Gardens, and I was like, that's a beautiful little plant. Yes. Neotropical blueberries are one of our specialties. Hmm. The area that we've entered right now, we've now come over into the uh, floor of the tabletop mountains of Venezuela and the Guiana Highlands. And so uh, one of my favorite groups of plants here are um, the Helianthros, which are carnivorous plants. Mm. They're actually related to the Saracenias that you saw this morning. Yeah. Same family. Only these guys grow on the tops of the tabletop mountains, right, where they've um, sort of uh, evolved in isolation from the flora that grows on the savanna below. So do you yeah. think these like kind of like had some kind of co-evolution kind of uh, with the Saracenias? Sure, sure. That trap is um, just a modified leaf. Leaf, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, fused into a, a tubular form. The trapping principle is sort of the same as a passive trap. Got downward pointing hairs and a slippery interior surface. And so um, the, the insect goes in and can't come out and is digested um, in the liquid below. Do you know what is the digestive fluid within there? Is it a type of hydrochloric acid or? Now this is one I believe that does not have enzymes, hmm. digestive enzymes. Okay. They just, it just dissolves inside. But you see the lure at the top of the picture. Do you see the inverted spoon? The little red top? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Produces a sticky sweet fluid to attract its prey. This is, is this cold damage or is this like reddening from the sun? Yeah. Reddening, reddening from, from the, the sun. sun. Yeah. I like how you have it as a ball or like a little bolus. <laughs> It's turned into a giant cabbage-like specimen. Yeah. That's a scaphocephalum. A scaphocephalum. Look at that tiny guy. And how long do these like typically bloom for? I mean, everything I'm sure is different, but are they like consecutive blooms? Do they bloom over the course of like a year? This month? one has been in flower continuously uh, for years. You can see all the old inflorescences yeah. down here. Yeah. So it you're, just keeps going. you're probably just getting the it just right. <laughs> Yeah, it's, hit the, it's, it's in its sweet spot here. Mm
Oh, I have to show you one of my favorite maxillarias back here. This is Maxillaria fractiflexa. Whoa. And I saw this for the first time actually in California, years before we built the Tropical High Elevation House and thought, that's one we need to have. It's like a sea creature. And there's a wonderful Tillandsia. Do you see the orange Tillandsia in flower above oh, it? Yeah. With it, a crinkly Yeah, this is leaves. very, I mean, it almost looks like it's dying. Yeah. <laughs> in, a, in a sort of <laughs> kind of weird way. It looks fake. It looks like plasticky, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. And there's another species up there. Right. Yeah. And those are also, you would find those in like the tabletop mountains. Is that still where we are? Uh, uh, South America in general. Okay. I actually love these. These are a type of fern, right? It is. Yeah. Is this an alaphoglossum or it which is, one? Okay. So now we're, we're headed over into, into Asia. Okay. <laughs> and you can see some of our Asiatic orchid flora. This is a really wonderful selogeny. I mean, this looks like um, an egg, like a sunny side up egg, the colors. <laughs> mm -hmm. This is another one that flowers almost continuously for us in this really nice, cool mm. environment. This is a, a called Brockhurst. Now, do you kind of stick to more uh, species, or are you also not, you know, you could, you, you also take a number of cultivars as well? That's one of the things that makes our orchid collection distinctive. You know, a lot of uh, places have um, collections that include lots of hybrids. Um, our permanent collection consists of just species orchids, because we want to show people what exists in nature mm -hmm. and why it's wonderful and worth conserving. So that's our lane. Right. So and a lot of people will have like orchid shows like at their botanic gardens. A lot of other botanic gardens will have orchid shows. A lot of those are hybrids. But is this like this is really part of your permanent collection then? Yes. We have hybrids in our, our orchid days, our yeah. spring 10 week orchid show and we use hybrids in that but they, those never enter our permanent collection and is that something that you're known for here yeah okay yeah. so your your permanent collection of your orchids and particularly like your alpine varieties is that something that is pretty distinctive here it is it's one of the things yeah that makes our that makes our collection unique um, we have one of the largest species collections in north america um, above us you can see some highland nepenthes if you're familiar with Nepenthes, you know there are a lot of them that yep. are at low elevations. Yeah. But these are the ones that, that grow um, at 6,000 feet and higher in the tropics. And are you caring for these very similarly to how you would care for this house in general? Um, like all Nepenthes, they want a ton of water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So is that enough with the mist system, or do you have to go, like, go up there and like hand water them? Oh, uh, we water. We, we actually water every day. You do. You water every day. Every day. Even with the mist system. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. It doesn't mean we water every plant every day, but we're yeah. in here with hoses. Um, hand watering every day. There's no yeah. automatic irrigation. Um, everything gets what it wants, when it wants yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. We're on their schedule. They're not on our schedule. Oh, and here's one of my favorites. Um, most people know this is Certicylum. It's been, there's a lot of flux going on now in orchid taxonomy, and so this I've one's been shifted around yeah, a lot. Yeah, I've read a lot of like lumping all together, and people went crazy because then all the species were lumped in one category in this one, you know. So are you a lumper or a splitter? Oh, you know, I'm in the middle. <laughs> but what's really cool about this, if, in case you're wondering where the actual plant is, um, they're growing on this uh, tree fern trunk oh, right it, here. The strap yeah. leaves. And it produces this enormously long inflorescence. You can see it's scrambling. Yeah, that's our cooling system coming on. <laughs> oh. Oh, I see. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So this is the the cold air being pumped up from the rain chamber down huh. below. Yeah. That water is pre-chilled to 42 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. And then it goes through the the spray wall. Yeah. So is that where you store your beers down there too? <laughs> it's like yeah, the a, wine it's coolers. Like basically yeah. like a refrigerator. You know? Amazing. And I, I could feel like the cool air coming through. Yeah. 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 So wait, is this, this is different from like the dancy, dancing ladies, right? It's a relative, yeah. It's a relative of yeah. it. Because it reminds me of that. They're just a little frillier, it looks like. That's right. And uh, it has actually been shifted to the genus Oncidium. Oncidium. Yeah. Oh, so it's in the same. Yeah, yeah. I and see. then more maxillarias down below. This is Maxillaria sandriana, that blood red center. 
Okay, so now we've come over to uh, the flora of uh, Mount Kinabalu mm -hmm. on the island of Borneo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, another area with very high endemism. Yeah. And so uh, you can, here you can see um, how Nepenthes would grow in nature. They start out as a rosette uh, down on the ground, and then they s scramble up into the shrub layer. Is this like a metanilla over here that had flowered? Or? Oh, it's a, it is a melastome, yeah, those are the fruits. So here's another one of our neotropical blueberries. Oh, right there, okay. Yeah, that's neo uh, Cavendishia micaensis, and uh, you'll notice the tubular flowers. They're hummingbird pollinated. And it is right above another species, um, Coca laboides, which actually has some fruits on it. Oh, yeah. Which you're this. welcome to try. Yes, like this one. Yeah. Is this a fruit? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't you touch anything in that Madagascar right or uh, South African exhibit. Are these like all little um, sugar crystals on mm -hmm. top? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat half insects. Of this. Even if they were, I would still eat it. <laughs> Oh, what do you think? All right, so it's not like a blueberry in the sense that it, it's much more watery, but ge but gelatinous, mm -hmm. with a faint tint of like a very faint tint of like a la like a floral lavender taste, mm -hmm. in my opinion. You want to give it a shot? Try half of it. Would you put that on your cereal? I wouldn't even waste it on my cereal. I'd eat it. I'd eat it. I'd eat it fresh and raw. It's like lavender grape. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. It's it's ge it's gelatinous like a grape, but grapes are even firmer. I feel. Yeah, this is not as firm as a grape. It's yes. Like a soft grape. And yes. It's still ripe. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Texture is a big part of it. But these are actually um, more nutritious than. The uh, cultivated blueberries that we get in this Oh, I'm, I'm sure yeah. we bastardized our fruits like so poorly, badly. Very high in antioxidants. Are the flowers edible? No, I haven't tried the flowers. Okay. I can't remember, but I, I could have swore okay. I ate an edible vibe. I could have swore I like ate a flower and. Yes, I did eat the flower. These taste like rhubarb. Do you know a rhubarb? Yeah. It tastes just like it. Okay. Yeah. A pie. Yeah. <laughs> What's this guy right here? Oh, that's an epidendrum. Isn't that a crazy color? Yeah, that's bizarre. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. And again, the really brightly colored leaves. What do you think pollinates this? Mmm. Butterflies? Could be. And what are these cute little guys over here with these, oh, like, those cherry, some... cherry faces? Those little, little lady slipper kind of thingies. That's right. Yeah. That's Phragmopedium schlemii, hmm. an Andean slipper orchid. Hmm. Oh, is that the, like a Bessie eye up there? Exactly. The little orange one? Yeah. Yeah. That one's famous for having been discovered and then lost. It's thought to have been extinct in the wild mm -hmm. and only existed in cultivation uh, thanks to the um, microprop lab at Marie Selby Botanical Garden. Ah. Subsequently, it was rediscovered in the wild. Um, in, in a distant population, um, but yeah, it's um, just indicative of how how important uh, artificial propagation is to um, saving threatened species. When you're doing artificial propagation, though, are you preserving kind of the diversity of the genes, or are you kind of micropropping like one specific species over and over and over again, or uh, one express one cell line, I guess? Okay, so I'm not an expert on this topic. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, there are different types of micropropagation. There's seed propagation, and then there's cloning, tissue culture. Mm -hmm. um, the goal with uh, having a conservation collection is to um, preserve as much genetic diversity as possible within uh, a population. Um, and so you want to have um, as much of that as possible. So you wouldn't want to clone them mm -hmm. yeah, uh, in the lab, um, unless you had an exceptional individual. Um, yeah, you would so want I guess, seed cultivation. I guess it really depends on your end goal. And if yeah. you're a conservation lab, you're going to want to focus on genetic diversity and maybe the seed micropropagation. Yeah. Okay. Since you're into Elaphoglossus, <laughs> um, we have a couple of really cool species here. 
That has the amazing sort of scurfy petals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. And look at how they, that one is emerging and it kind of looks yeah. like it has like cornflakes on it or something, yeah. you know? And this is like burned mm -hmm. cornflakes. Very meaty leaf. And then there's another one over in the corner with yeah. black hairs. Wow. And there's a fertile frond. Look at that. Ooh, it's creepy. It's like um, the legs of a, an arachnid, you know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so they need a super humid environment. Yeah. Yeah, not a house plant. We'll continue our tour through the orchid exhibit in the next episode. In the meantime, we trust you're enjoying these tours, tips, and more on the channel, and ask that you consider liking, subscribing, and hitting the notifications button. Additionally, you could become a sustaining member on the channel or enroll in any one of our houseplant courses online, which you could find on homesteadbrooklyn.com. 1% of our Google AdSense revenue is donated back to plant conservation initiatives, so we and the plants thank you for your viewership and support. We'll see you in the next episode.